Welcome, welcome to this channel Baruch Abba Hashem Yahuwah and today we are doing the last part of this in-depth study series Song of Songs all based on a deeper understanding of the book of Song of Songs from Solomon and the spiritual understanding behind these uh, scriptures and behind the entire totalness of that song. All right, Mature Love is the title. Groaning for Bodily Release. This is the last uh, chapter, I think. It's eight chapters, yeah. All right, this last section of the song begins with the spouse's longing for deliverance from the bondage and groaning of the physical nature. And my excuse and apology for the environmental noise on the background, that is the local government doing gardening. As the believer grows into deeper union with Mashiach, as in the case of this loved maiden, there is an increasing realization that the presence of the outer man or carnal shell imposes limitation upon the spirit within. The inner man is renewed daily, but the outer man decays day by day. The corruptible day, the corruptible body of flesh is kept for its allotted period by the revivings and refreshments of the Holy Spirit, but it must needs to die. The power of <clears throat> the universal father of this universe is often displayed through its weaknesses Yet the body of flesh remains very much as a thorn in the side of the spirit. That is why I never understood why this body was created in such a way that it is dependent on everything outside itself. Why this body never was a self-sustainable uh, mechanism. <clears throat> I never understood why this body was in such a way unhandy, unhandy created because I truly believe that it was, uh, it, it shouldn't have to be that complex. I know this from deeper inner knowing. Thus, as the believer increases in spiritual affections and develops into maturity, he is made conscious that final perfection is still curtailed by the present limitations of the flesh. Even though the believer has borne the first fruits of resurrection life in his inner man, yet he is not exempted or exempted from that groaning within which is um, echoed by the whole creation. So for now, we know this. All right. O oh, that thou wert as any O oh, that thou wert as my brother that sucked the breasts of my mother when I should find thee without I would kiss thee yea I should not be despised all right. In ancient Yasharal, public kissing between men and women, even by husband and wife, was considered a breach of the standards of decency. The only exception allowed was between blood relatives, such as brother and sister. Hence, the maiden felt restrained and unable to display adequately to the world the reality of his loving loveliness and the depth of her love for him. So in effect, she was saying, oh, that thou wert my brother, that there could be a full manifestation of the complete oneness of our relationship in the universal father of this universe. So that when I publicly acknowledge and express my love to thee, my beloved, I should not be despised and ridiculed by others as being in discreetly affectionate. While this state of existence here in the body uh, persists, 
I am very aware of my inability to be unto thee all I should be, and that the despisings of others restrain my affections. In the beginning, my sole desire was for thee to kiss me so that I could glorify in thy love as my own possession. But now it is who, you know, but now it is I who desire to kiss thee. I would continually express my love to thee and seek to satisfy thy heart with my love. The chief hindrance to this full expression of my affections is my earthboundness, that stupid flesh. While I remain in this body, the full manifestation of utter oneness of nature as that of a brother cannot as yet be realized. Many, many words for just two sentences. I am uh, ever under the conviction, therefore, that I do not serve thee as I ought. Unfortunately, we are. I would lead thee and bring thee into my mother's house, who would instruct me. I would cause thee to drink of spiced wine of the juice of my pomegranate. All right. So she continues something like this, when that day of perfect liberty comes, it will be most necessary, my beloved, to lead thee into Jerusalem above, which is the mother of us all, um, so that I may learn to express perfectly the great doctrine of grace, teaching of grace. I will then know that nothing is owing to the flesh, not a thing, no, it's just stupid flesh, that's it, that's what it is. I must have final deliverance, yeah, transfiguration, therefore from this body of flesh, so that not even this unglorified flesh shall have any part in my praise any longer. All right. <clears throat> Then all the spiritual fruit which my life has borne of shall be pressed into a fragrant wine to fill up thine own cup of delight. The spiritual fruit given by thee shall not have one iota of fleshly glory. Thankfully, that flesh is then gone. Nor shall there be the least thing for my personal satisfaction. All right, next. His left hand should be under my head and his right hand should embrace me here she is saying on that blessed day of final deliverance from earthly limitations yay i will be in thy full embrace thy left hand will be under my head steadying me to look constantly into thy face the right hand will hold me in such loving embrace that I shall be able to behold thee face to face as I lie nearest thy heart and in thy bosom. Such a day, my beloved, is the desire of my heart, not my heart, it's the desire of your spirit. Yeah? The desire of your spirit, not of your heart, your spirit desires this. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, that ye stir not up nor awake my love until ye please. The virgin spouse now dwells on the top and on the hope of her master's return and of being soon taken up to be with him forever. Her feelings are ecstatic, as these are now legitimate and right by reason of her full and mature affections. It is a state of blessed anticipation and the fruit of her long spiritual exercise. She would not have others disturb this blessed anticipation or interference with any stretched out hand of flesh so as to disrupt her spiritual life again until she rises into his glorious presence. Okay, 
hopefully this is the last section yeah but I'm not going all into it all right preparation for the second coming which is nothing more than changing of the guard actually finally we come to the last verses of chapter 8 and thus end of that chapter then finally we view her as just prior to the rapture in verses 5 to 14 who so-called rapture who is this that cometh up from the wilderness leaning upon her beloved i raised thee up under the apple tree citron tree there thy mother brought thee forth there she uh, brought thee forth that bare thee <laughs> <clears throat> twice in the song mentioned is made of her coming up from the wilderness the first reference is in chapter 3 verse 6 was at the commencement of her union with the master there followed a renunciation of herself for the master then came the desire to live altogether in the life of the master and thus in the life of the father Finally, she went on to dwell in all the blessings of grace bestowed by the Master. From that point onward, she made constant and considerable progress, and as she went forward, she began to leave behind that kind of poor spiritual life represented by the figure of a wilderness in moving out of this de deserted type of life. As we find deliverance from the wilderness of inward spiritual wandering, so also we may find like freedom from the outward power and pressure of the world around us, which is true freedom. No one knows what true freedom actually means. And if they don't, uh, and if they know what true freedom is, they don't. They do not want to make the steps for it to come in that actual true freedom. Ha! Humanity, wake up, find your true freedom that is not going into these false agendas of becoming sovereign. True freedom is following the path of the universal father of this universe. That brings you to true freedom. All right. For when the Holy Spirit takes complete control of us through his indwelling presence, Holy Spirit is not a he, it's a she. Through her in the indwelling presence then we experience deliverance not only from the wilderness within but from the wilderness without it is the stake of mashiach or christ which delivers us from the spiritual wilderness and it is the call of his return which delivers us from our wandering through and the holdings of the present fake 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 world all right when is humanity finally going to realize that they are for uncountable thousands and thousands and thousands of years living in a wilderness when is humanity finally going to see this and waking themselves up to this fact so the promise of his return summons us to readiness the holy spirit again employs the method of interrogation through a third party perhaps one of her relatives who, who is this that cometh up from the wilderness? So the Holy Spirit pictures to us the maiden coming up from the wilderness, leaning harder and harder and harder and harder upon her beloved. As she proceeds, she comes clearer and clearer into vision and focus. The question he asks is, who is she? Who is she? Yeah, that's something I'm asking too. Who is she? Who is this body of believers? Whom are they?
This is meant to excite a very clear reply from the beloved one himself, better known as Mashiach or for many still known as Christ. All right. So we must never imagine that the sudden event of the Master's return and our translation will affect any sudden change in our spiritual condition. It is spiritual fitness which makes us ready for his return. And this demands a close walk with the Father, the universal Father of this universe. Through Christ or Mashiach that is within us. The present then is a time for preparation and the best preparation is that which is seen in this maiden as she comes more and more out from the world and leans closer and closer upon the Father. I stop with saying beloved because uh, th th that gives me some un unpleasantness. Because the false ones also using the word beloved. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, then comes the recognition in herself that she is holy without any strength and needs. She needs him, the father, to support her on every, um, in every step of the walk. Leaning upon the Father, the universal Father of this universe, that is what we all should do, but no one is truly doing. So the Master Yeshua, until it is asked with a true sense of amazement, who is this leaning upon Him? And then it said, I raised thee up under the apple tree, there thy mother brought thee forth, there she brought thee forth that bare thee. So she is none other than a poor sinner sought by grace, discovered by grace and saved by grace. And this grace, the, the, the Jerusalem which is above. Not the physical Jerusalem, but the heavenly Jerusalem, which is the mother of us all. All right, you can read this in Galatians 4, verse 26. And this includes the universal Father's eternal plan and divine election, the whole redemptive work of his eternal Son, known as Christ, Michael, and the sanctifying process of the Holy Spirit, known as the infinite Spirit, Grace is the whole work of the three Ewan Father, as recorded in uh, His Holy Word. Uh, when that grace seeks out a sinner, such a one is placed under the overshadowing of the Savior. Who is the Savior? That is the universal Father of this universe. Who commands is love and travails for that one until life is given. And that one rises up into the reality of the love of Christ and thus into the reality of the love of the universal father of this universe. Well, um, mm -hmm. all right. Verse 6, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. After the reminder of her true origin, she could not help but cherish deep feelings of humility. She would be conscious of her own nothingness. <laughs> Body of believers, when are you going to see this 
nothingness that you are. <laughs> oh, much. Oh. The fruitlessness of her own efforts. Oh, yeah. When are you going to see, body of believers, that you are actually nothingness, that you are producing fruitlessness, that all your efforts that you are doing is fruitless? Her undependable aspirations and the unrewarding search on her part for anything of value. Now all her hope was focused upon the Father himself and through Christ in her. All right. And then she's saying, you know, she, the body of believers is saying, oh, um, oh Father, f uh, for me to try to keep myself until I see thy face would only spell shame to thy name and bring about my own loss and failure. <clears throat> Having come to the realization of this truth, she now had to say, set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. Well, the heart is the seed of love, if the heart is pure, clear, <laughs> and the arm is where strength lies. All right. Next, verse 7. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be con contempt. <clears throat> so thy love, the master with its flame of divine fire, cannot be quenched by the many waters of trials and testings, nor by the floods which pour forth from a persecuting enemy. Neither trials nor persecutions can do anything to prevent thy love to me. <clears throat> Such love as thine cannot be purchased nor can there be found in any substitute. Well, this is all repeat. Neither the tongues of men or so-called angels have any value apart from thy love. Nor the understanding of all mysteries, nor the acquiring of all knowledge, nor the possession of all faith is a sufficient exchange for thine own dear love. Though I were to give all my goods to feed the poor and my body to be burned, they are to be utterly despised as a substitute for thy love. Next verse. We have a little sister and she hath no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? We see in this spouse then one who dwells fully in the love of Christ. She could not help but remember the fact that there were others who would like to enjoy such love before she herself had come through to the realized presence of the Master. And so to behold his face, our great concern had been over the immaturity of other believers. Now in his presence, therefore, she mentions her little sister, by which she means those believers in whom there is a measure of life, but very much immaturity in faith and love towards him. Because of her own complete union with the Master, she is now able to pour out her 
hearts concerned directly to him about this matter. What shall we do is her burden for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for. So this immature sister had come to see in the spouse an example of true life and true love. She had the hope that the eternal lover would by means of the Holy Spirit, energy and work lead her into the same kind of love, union and fellowship. In view of her desire, what could be done for her? Regarding her measure of life and her spiritual development, she was but a little sister. The fact that her breasts were undeveloped indicated a lack of maturity in spiritual stature and affections. Believers such as these demand the loving concern of the more mature for no undeveloped state of spiritual love can give the master any satisfaction at all. In the life of every believer there comes a day when such a one is spoken for and appealed to by the master to respond or not to respond. Rests in one's liberty to choose. But there is no exception to the rule that the master requires a full growth of love and faith in each believer. The question arises, therefore, how can we help our little sister and remedy such an undeveloped condition? <clears throat> All right. This thus burdened with the immature state of others the spouse now communes with her uh, uh, with the christ in her about it she herself is so much in the will of the uh, universal father that she can use the familiar we her concern was now so much in unity with the master's mind that she could say we what she desired him to do was exactly what the master the, 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 wanted to do therefore she said we all right but wow. she was matured to a state of we all right and though she was in complete union and harmony with Mashiach or better said Christ in her and so in harmony and union with the universal father of this universe. And so her prayer was no longer a petition, but rather an expression of the will of the father himself. That is the type of prayers we should do. Mm. And there was no selfish interest in her any longer, but truly concern about the undeveloped, the un, the, 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 the spiritual undeveloped little sister, the unbelievers, better said, <laughs> the group of unbelievers. <clears throat> If she be a wall, we, we will build upon her a palace of silver, and if she be a door, we will enclose her with boards of cedar. All right. Yeah, I thought so. If there be in her something that is truly of the universal father of this universe and thus something which makes her different and separated from all that is not of the universal father as a wall would suggest, then there is ground upon which can be built a so-called palace of silver. There can be constructed upon her life all that is derived from redemption and all that is high and noble. If she is indeed living a life separated unto the Father, through the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, then her life can be built up 
with the fruits of redemption, if she be a door, that is, if she is indeed such a witness, that others may enter by her into the true knowledge of the universal father of this universe, then we will build into her the new heavenly life of Mashiach, better known as Christ, whose countenance is as the setters. We, that is I, with the help of your example, well, we is we, that is this strangely formed here. So they both desired nothing but the best for this little sister, that is the representation of the body of unbelievers. Then we go back to this wall again. I am a wall and my breasts like towers. When uh, then was I in his eyes as one that found favor. All right, what did they say here? All right, she views herself as one that is set apart for the master himself. Her remark about her breasts was an attestation that her faith and love depended solemnly upon separation from the world for their development had grown to full maturity. And so Christ had built up these and strongly establish them in her. Mm -hmm. She had become one who had begun to enjoy a true life of peace. Wow, this type of text. We see from this that separation is the foundation of such a life and that <clears throat> True peace issues from maturity of faith and love. Yeah. Give up everything you hold dear. That's the whole message of this whole study. Give up everything you hold dear, your stupid carnal jobs and whatever, money, bank accounts, give up everything and just live the life of the Most High Himself, the Universal Father of this universe, and He shall give you everything that you need. That is what is mentioned with seek His kingdom. No one understands that sentence. Seek His kingdom and everything shall be given unto you. Uh, what do the believers translate this into? Oh, seek his kingdom, and my Porsche shall be given to me, my villa, my this, my that, and everything. <clears throat> so not any, uh, not many, better said in the body of believers, do truly understand what this sentence, this phrase means. Seek the, my kingdom and everything shall be given unto you. What is this everything? Shelter, food, protection. She might have boasted how strong a wall she had become or how well developed her breasts were, but, not, but no, she morally makes the simple statement that she was now in the eyes of Christ. And thus the universal father of this universe, as one that had found favor. All right. Solomon had a vineyard at Baal Hamon. He let out the vineyard unto keepers, every one for the fruit thereof was to bring a thousand pieces of silver. Verse 11, here is a facet of truth to which the Holy Spirit would direct the attention of believers before the Master's return. It is the handing out of rewards according to the degree of labor. Which labor? Labor that you do 
in accordance with the will, desires, and needs of whom? The universal father of this universe, represented through Christ. Mm -hmm. B-A-A-L, Hamon means the master of multitude, such was Solomon, he thought he was. <laughs> Thus, in fulfillment of the type, so is the master, Yeshua Mashiach, or better known as Christ. He is the master of many servants. Solomon's rule was that the fruits of the vineyard went to the keepers so that according to their labor they partook of the fruits. Thus we are to till, plant, keep, prune, and nurture the master's ground and plants, and he will presently reward such keepers with the increase of the fruits. Doesn't mean the real garden in your backyard and the vine that you have there. No, this is all spiritually based. It means the spiritual garden. It means finding the lost sheep to take care of them, to take care of the remnants, sojourners, strangers, Gentiles, whomever the Father sends you to. And doing the work that the Father is ordering you to do. And from that work, you get the fruits. So what is done for him is never in vain. Even the giving of a cup of cold water shall have its reward. And the thing is that we need to step, off, step out of this conditioned idea of rewards as in physical things. Our rewards are laid in the spiritual people. And the, 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 the whole word reward is highly misunderstood in this world and is connected to material things, money, goods, material nonsense. Most of the time we do not even need all right, I go to the next verse. My vineyard, which is mine, is before me. Thou, O Solomon, must have a thousand, and those that keep the fruit thereof, two hundred. She now singled herself out from the company of many. She was not an ordinary keeper of Solomon's many vineyard keepers. So she said, to the Leluki, I'm going for the Father, not for the flesh, not for the carnal world, not for anything that the fake carnal world is trying to lure me in. Out of pure affection, this maiden also met the claim and should love's affection give less than the law's demand. Not so she paid out of love that which was her measure of responsibility. All right. Because she now stood on a higher level of spiritual life and had a closer and more intimate relationship with the Father through his uh, Christ. Her service was altogether different from that of the great number who served the who served the Father through Christ. Many do him service from convictions of duty. The love maiden served out of love, yet her service never fell beneath the demand required by duty. Not only Solomon profited from this kind of service, but those who kept watch over the fruits were also profitably employed. 
that is, all workers who assisted in any way in gathering the fruits were given some credit by her. Her is the body of believers. All right. Verse 13. Thou that dwellest in the gardens, the companions, hearken to thy voice, cause me to hear it. So, the plural gardens recognizes that the master does not dwell exclusively in only her garden, but in many gardens is us, each person that has immersed and has been immersed in his name, he dwells in many gardens. Make haste, my beloved, and be thou like to a roe or to a young heart, which is H-A-R-T, upon the mountains of spices. What she breathes forth here is identical with her appeal in chapter 2, verse 17. Where a similar prayer is recorded, these two apples, however, have to do with totally different incidents. Yet here too, we have noticed the mention of two wildernesses. <clears throat> so now we see mention of two returns. Two returns. Chapter 2, verse 17 and chapter 8, verse 14. Like a roe or young deer upon the mountains, we might say the first appeal for his return in chapter 2, verse 17 refers to a return to fellowship with him, the father of this universe through Christ. She had lost that. Darkness has settled down on her soul in those days because of lack of response. She then cried out for a restored communion so that the shadows round her life would flee away. She thus pleaded with him to come over the mountains of Bether or separation. So to bring her into deeper levels of separation. In the present verse, the urgent cry for him to come to her has to do with the second coming, which is still in the future and may be very soon. Well, <laughs> we don't know when that is. The emphasis here is not on a restored fellowship, but on his coming again, which will bring into manifestation the phenomena of his kingdom. Thus, it is no longer the mountains of Bether, which are mentioned, but the mountains of spices. This is a figure of the new millennial world. After fragrance and beauty, people, we are in the end stage of the thousand year cycle and we are going into a new cycle of thousand years and with a new cycle of thousand years we have a changing of guard that's what it is and with the changing of the guard, which means that the bestowal Christ Michael is probably the one that shall come back, but no one in this universe is sure about that. Only the Father knows. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> It even is possible that the original Adam and Eve can come back to finish off what they never could finish. <clears throat> and then they will reign the new thousand year period in a way that they from the beginning should have done. But due to circumstances, 
never were able to come to fruition in that and eventually to fulfill that. So no one knows whom actually is coming back. Is it the bestowal? Christ Michael himself as Joshua or for many known as Jesus? Is it Adam, Eve, Adam and Eve who come back? But one thing is for sure that the Melchizedek's sons, their teachers, better said, because there will come uh, Melchizedek teachers come back on earth here to teach us into the values principles and morals of the universal father of this universe and to undo all falsehoods and to wipe us clean from every false belief <clears throat> and teaching At this point, her experience was like a drop of water, losing itself in the ocean, mingling deeper and ever, mingling deeper and ever deeper with the love of Christ. There seems to be little left in the realm of earth, but her physical body, her heart's affections are in another world. Little wonder, therefore, that she cries out with urgency, Make haste, my beloved, as the roe or young heart lights upon the mountains of spices, so do thou descend into thy glorious kingdom. Although full and mature, my love for thee has now become Yet there remains something more which can be satisfied only by thy coming. Then shall faith become sight, and prayer shall be praised forever. Love shall then reach its climax and be freed from the shadows of cloud. Then shall I serve and worship before thee in a sinless state. What a day, what a day, what a day that will be. So Master Yeshua or Christ Michael, make haste, come quickly. Amen, even so, come to the Master Yeshua. And until that glorious day, may my garden continually bear its fruit for the delight of thy heart. And let your glory be bestowed, bestowed upon us. All right, and with this said, I have come to the end of this in-depth study series known as Song of Songs, unveiling the mystery of passionate intimacy with Christ or Mashiach. And thus actually passionate intimacy with the Father of this universe, the universal Father of this universe, and so the eternal righteous creator of this universe.
Thank you for coming to this channel. Thank you for uh, listening to these words of wisdom, to this teaching, for the messages, the warnings and everything that uh, has uh, been said. And thank the Father for the fact that you have been guided to this channel and to the in-depth studies uh, presented on this channel. Work them through. Um, and learn from it and be edified by it. They all edify your mind, uh, your soul, your heart, give you a renewed mind. And um, <clears throat> I wish you all a tremendous Baruch day and praise the Most High in all the things you do. And my excuse for the enormous uh, environmental sound, what I say, the local government is doing some gardening because their way of gardening is not the way that uh, should be done. Um, Baruch Abba Bashem Yahuwah, Hallelujah Yahuwah, Hallelujah Yahuwah, Hallelujah Yahuwah. All right, thank you.